is Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Two treasure hunters stood on the top of Jebel Allah's thinking it was the real Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. One was struck with fear because he thought he was trespassing on the holiest place on earth. As he gulped down Gatorade and munched on M&Ms, a sense of guilt overcame him because he had forged a letter from the king of Saudi Arabia in order to obtain a visa into the kingdom, Cornick and Halbrook 2010, 11, 74, 77, 79, Blum 1998, 206. Should he have felt guilty for this deceit? Yes, what he did was illegal, and offended the honor of the Saudi Arabian people. Should he have been afraid because he was on the holy mountain of God, Exodus 19 verse 12? No, because he was standing on the wrong mountain. Nzan Sinai is not in Saudi Arabia. This article will examine four aspects of the question regarding whether or not Mount Sinai is located in Saudi Arabia. First, the credibility of the claims will be questioned. Second, the false assumptions by the proponents of Jebel al-Laws will be disputed. Third, the biblical evidence will be discussed. Fourth, the archaeological evidence will be examined. Mount Sinai was the destination of Moses and the children of Israel after the Lord miraculously delivered them from the bondage of Egypt, Exodus 18 verse 5. It was from this mountain that the Lord also gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and the people of Israel, Exodus 19 verses 1 to 3, 11 18, 20 colon 1 17. Here, too, the prophet Elijah found himself after his escape from wicked Queen Jezebel, 1 Kings 19. Pilgrims, scholars and tourists have visited the traditional site, Jebel Musa, Arabic for the Mountain of Moses, for more than 1,600 years. In the early 4th century AD Eusebius of Caesarea placed Mount Sinai in the southern Sinai Peninsula. When Egeria made a pilgrimage to the east between AD 381 and 384, she visited Jebel Musa as Mount Sinai, Wilkinson 1981, 1, 18, 91 to 100. This impressive mountain located in the southern Sinai Peninsula is situated behind the Byzantine Monastery of St. Catharines built by Emperor Justinian in the middle of the 6th century AD, Safrir 1978 219. It may come as a surprise to most people, but scholars have identified 13 different sites as the real Mount Sinai, Har El 1983 2. I would agree with the proponents of the Jebel al-Law's hypothesis that Jebel Musa, the traditional Mount Sinai, or any other site in the southern Sinai Peninsula, could not be the real Mount Sinai. Professor Harel in his book, The Sinai Journeys, has argued very convincingly, against the southern Sinai theory, 1983, 175-233. Recently, six American treasure hunters have added a 14th mountain to the already long list of candidates for the real Mount Sinai, Jebel al -Laz. Who's who among the treasure hunters? The idea of Mount Sinai being in Midian, Saudi Arabia, is not new. Charles Beek suggested Mount Bagger, to the N.E. of the Gulf of Aqaba, as the true location of Mount Sinai in his book Sinai in Arabia and of Midian in 1878. Alois Musel, 1926. 263,264, 269, 296 to 298, and H. Philby, 1957, 222 to 224, identify Mount Sinai slash Horeb with Jebel al Manifa near Wadi al Rab, 20 kilometers north of Ajnuna, 1926, 269, 297. A French scholar, Jean Koenig, 1971, has added the volcanic peak of Halad el Bedr to the list. The late Ron Wyatt, a certified registered nurse anesthetist CRNA, turned treasure hunter, added a fourth Minion site, Jebel al -Laz, to the list. He also claimed to have discovered Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, the Red Sea crossing and some of Pharaoh's chariots, the Ark of the Covenant with the blood of Jesus on the mercy seat and other spectacular archaeological discoveries. This list is enough to make any archaeologist green with envy. However, one of Wyatt's partners in his Saudi Arabian venture called it a treasure hunt, Fazold 1993 BU4. In 1978, Wyatt claimed to have discovered the Red Sea crossing at Nuaba in the Gulf of Aqaba, the eastern branch of the Red Sea, and some of Pharaoh's chariot wheels. This led Wyatt to conclude that Mount Sinai must be in Saudi Arabia. His candidate for Mount Sinai was Jebel Outlaws because it was the highest peak in the entire NW Saudi Arabian region, Norberg in 1982, 157-174. In 
In 1984, Ron Wyatt and his two sons illegally crossed the border of Jordan into Saudi Arabia to visit the site. They explored and photographed the area around Jebel al -Laz. As they tried to get back across the border they were captured, their film confiscated, and were jailed for 78 days as Israeli spies. They were eventually released. In April 1985, Wyatt returned to Saudi Arabia legally under the patronage of a certain Mr. Samran al Motari. This time he had a contract with Samran to split the take on any commercial minerals found by them on their treasure hunt, Fazl 1993b, 4-6, Blum 1998-47. To help locate the gold, Wyatt convinced David Fazl, with his molecular frequency generator, MFG, into joining their expedition to search for the gold of Exodus, Blum 1998 49 to 51. Fazold claims this device can detect various types of metal under the ground. When one of Samran's workers discovered a bracelet that glittered for all the world like the purest of gold, Blum 1998 58, they were arrested and charged with robbing Saudi Arabia of its wealth from antiquity, which they claimed was a capital offense, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 218. When they were finally released, all their film and notes were confiscated, and they were made to promise they would never return to Saudi Arabia and never publish or talk about their findings, Blum 1998, 59, Williams 1990, 25. Upon his return, Fazl told Jim Irwin, the Apollo 15 astronaut who walked on the moon. Irwin in turn put Fazl in touch with two other potential treasure hunters, Larry Williams, a commodity trader and part-time treasure hunter, and Robert Cornick, a former police officer and SWAT team member, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 218. Fazl told them about the location of Mount Sinai and the gold from Egypt. Part of his material is reproduced in Williams' book, 1990, 25, 209 to 211, as well as his own newsletters, 1993A, 1993B. Before they began this venture, they consulted an unnamed university professor in California, who wishes his identity to remain a deep dark secret, Blum 1998, 108. He seemed to agree with this idea and encouraged them in their pursuit. Williams and Cornock journeyed to Saudi Arabia twice in the summer of 1988 as self-proclaimed adventurers of history in search of Mount Sinai and the gold of Exodus. They returned to tell the tale, Williams 1990 10, 23. Larry Williams wrote a book about their adventures entitled The Mountain of Moses, The Discovery of Mount Sinai, 1990. It was later reprinted under the title The Mount Sinai Myth, 1990. Another author, Howard Blum also wrote a popular book entitled The Gold of Exodus, The Discovery of the True Mount Sinai, 1998a, based on the adventures of these two treasure hunters. The book has some inconsistencies. For example, Ronald Handel, 1999-54, points out that before Williams and Cornock went to Saudi Arabia in the summer of 1988, they had a meeting with an unnamed biblical scholar from Southern California. During the course of the conversation the unnamed scholar mentioned an interview of Dr. Frank Moore Cross in the August 1992 edition of Bible Review, Blum 1998 120-122. Talk about getting an advanced copy of a publication. How did this professor get a copy of a 1992 issue of Bible Review in 1988? The book is excerpted in an article in the February 1998 issue of Vanity Fair, Bloom 1998b. A video entitled, The Search for the Real Mount Sinai, 1998, is being distributed based on these books. According to the advertisement for the video, Herschel Shanks, the editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, endorsed this video by saying, Jabal al-Laz is the most likely site for Mount Sinai. A weak review of Bloom's book and the video was given by Ronald Handel in the July-August 1999 issue of Biblical Archaeology Review, pages 54, 56, in which he never adequately deals with the arguments set forth by Williams and Blum. A spirited response appeared in the November-December 1999 issue of the same magazine by Tom Beard, the producer of the video, pages 66-67. Herschel Shanks also added a clarification of his endorsement. He said, the quote attributed to me is accurate but incomplete. I went on to say that all identifications of Mount Sinai are highly speculative. A good case has been made that it is somewhere in northwest Saudi Arabia, and Jebel al laz is the highest point in this area, page 67. In the spring of 2000, 
Bob Cornuck came out with his book that recounts their adventures in Saudi Arabia. The book is entitled In Search of the Mountain of God with the subtitle The Discovery of the Rail. Mount Sinai, Cornuck and Halbrook 2000. It is basically a retelling of his and William's adventures found in the other books, but it also has a section at the end of the book about their search for Pharaoh's chariots in the Gulf of Aqaba. He has a tendency to embellish, just like Blum. For example, he claims the signs on the fence surrounding Jebel al said, no trespassing allowed. Violators will be put to death, Cornuck and Halbrook 2001. Yet if one looks at the photograph in Bloom's book, the sign actually says, Archaeological Area Warning, it is unlawful to trespass. Violators are subject to penalties stipulated in the Antiquities Regulations passed by Royal Decree No. M26, U June 23, 1392 inch, 1998, plate 4, top. Williams, 1990, 157, just mentions the fines, but not the death penalty. The thesis of these books and video is that the real Mount Sinai is located at Jebel el Laws in Saudi Arabia, and the gold that the Israelites took from the Egyptians is in them their hills. Are their views correct? The simple answer is no. There are a number of significant problems with this view. Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula right where the Bible places it. Problems with this view the biggest problem with the identification of Mount Sinai at Jebel el Laws is that it does not meet the biblical criteria for the site. These claims are based on three false assumptions and a misunderstanding of the archaeological remains that they observed. It is beyond the scope of this article to deal with the Red Sea crossing and the chronology of the exodus from Egypt to Mount Sinai. I will tackle these issues in a future issue of Bible and Spade. False assumption number one, the Sinai Peninsula was considered the land of Egypt. The first false assumption is that the Sinai Peninsula was within the territorial borders of the land of Egypt. Over and over in his book, Williams, 1990, 15-17, 26, calls the Sinai Peninsula the Egyptian Peninsula. If one looks at a modern Rand McNally road map, the Sinai Peninsula is part of modern-day Egypt. However, 3,500 years ago, that was not the case. The Bible says that once the Israelites left Sukkot, they were out of Egypt, Exodus 13 verses 18 to 20. The land of Goshen was the eastern limits of the land of Egypt. Apparently, the fortresses on the eastern frontier canal was the border between Egypt and the Sinai, Hoffmeyer 1997, 164 to 175. Sir Flinders Petrie, the father of Palestinian archaeology, states that the copper and turquoise mines in Sinai were in the desert outside the territorial border of Egypt, which passed to the east of the Delta, emphasis mine, cited in Williams 1990, 56. Ironically Williams missed the implication of this statement. One gets the impression reading Williams, Blum and Cornock that the Egyptians had year-round mining activities and a standing army all over Sinai, Williams 1990, 58. It is true there were turquoise mines at Sarabit el Kadem in southern Sinai, Bait Area 1993 colon 4 colon 1335 1338. However, as Petrie, 1906, 8, 169, points out, mining was seasonal, from January to April, so the Israelites would have found Sinai quite empty when they left Egypt. He concluded, the argument that the Israelites would not have traveled down to the region of the Egyptian mines has no force whatever. The Egyptians never occupied that mining district with a garrison, but only sent expeditions, at the most these were in alternate years, and in the time of Maranta only once in many years, Petrie 1906, 206. It is also true that there were Egyptian soldiers garrisoned in fortresses in Sinai. However, those fortresses were limited to northern Sinai. Alan Gardner, a leading Egyptologist, did an important study from the Egyptian sources of the ways of Horus across the northern Sinai, 1920, 99-116. An extensive survey and some excavations were conducted between 1972 and 1982 along this road in northern Sinai. The excavator concluded, the survey results enable us for the first time to delineate the course of the ways of Horus in accurate detail, and to reconstruct the history of settlement and the degree of Egyptian activity on the land bridge between the Delta and Southern Canaan, or in 1987, 76.
One can understand why God did not lead them, the children of Israel, by the way of the land of the Philistines, another name for the ways of Horus, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war, with the Egyptian garrisons, and return to Egypt. Exodus 13 verse 17, NKJV, the parenthetical statements are the authors. This verse also places the Sinai Peninsula outside the land of Egypt. If the children of Israel saw war with the Egyptian garrisons on the ways of Horus in the Sinai Peninsula, they would return to Egypt. The Sinai was outside the land of Egypt. Another archaeologist who excavated extensively in Sinai observed, ancient Egyptian hegemony never extended into south-central Sinai. The Egyptians did reach the western strip of southern Sinai, where they worked the turquoise mines of Sarabit el Kadem and similar mines at nearby Wadi Megara. But despite the fact that south-central Sinai contains copper deposits that were highly prized in ancient times, there is no evidence to indicate that the Egyptians were active in the exploitation of these copper deposits, Vidaria 1988, 36. Williams, 1990, 57, 58, and others wonder how the Israelites could wander in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years without running into the Egyptians. As noted above, there were some parts of Sinai that did not have any Egyptians. It should also be kept in mind what happened at the Red Sea. Pharaoh's elite force of 600 chariots and all his other chariots, Exodus 14 verses 7 and 9, 23 to 30, Josephus says that there was an additional 50,000 horsemen and 200,000 infantry, Antiquities 2 324, LCL 4, 307, were destroyed when the Red Sea collapsed on them, Exodus 14 verses 23 to 30, 15 4, 5. As a result, Israel feared and believed the Lord, Exodus 14 verse 31. The Philistines, Edomites, Moabites, and Canaanites were afraid and trembled, Exodus 15 verses 14 to 16, Josh 2:10. If there were any military units left in Sinai, either from an expedition to the turquoise mines in southern Sinai or guarding the ways of Horus in northern Sinai, what Egyptian military commander in his right mind would want to confront Israel? They understood Moses' statement that the Lord was a man of war and he was an awesome and powerful God, X 15, 3, 6, 7, if. 1425 NKJV. Cornuck raises the problem of the lack of archaeological evidence for Israel in Sinai. After citing Bidaria's 1984 article in Biblical Archaeology Review, he says, 15 years of exhaustive, painstaking investigation by veteran archaeologists found nothing to suggest as many as two and a half million Jewish pilgrims once flooded the Egyptian landscape. No trace of a mighty host littering the wilderness with their smoking campfires, stores of food, cookpots, and acres of pottery, ceremonial implements and utensils, weapons, jewels, trinkets, and religious objects. No evidence of huge herds, flocks, or the daily waste and abandoned junk of a wandering multitude. Nothing, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 168. In another article, Dr. Bidaria, 1988, 37, reiterates the problem, nowhere have we found any material remains of human occupation at the time, late Bronze Age 1550-1200 BC, when the exodus is supposed to have occurred. He continues with a plausible solution to the problem, although I do not think he believes it, perhaps it will be argued, by those who subscribe to the traditional account in the Bible, that the Israelite material culture was only of the flimsiest kind and left no trace. Presumably the Israelite dwellings and artifacts consisted only of perishable materials, Bite Aria 1988, 37. The above results are understandable under normal conditions. Perhaps Kornak did not consider that when the Israelites left Egypt, they had their kneading bowls, probably made of wood, the clothes on their back and any other clothes the Egyptians gave them. They also asked for, and received, gold and silver, Exodus 3 verses 21 and 22, 11 verses 2 and 3, 12, 34, 35. Josephus adds that they received vessels of brass, which were used for their manna, metals, woven fabrics, decorations for armor, beasts of burden, and military implements, antiquities of the Jews 357, LCL 4, 347. The armor they picked up after the Egyptians drowned in the Red Sea, Antiquities of the Jews 359, LCL 4, 347. They dwelt in tents made from goat hair, not buildings. They also had the promise of God that their clothes and sandals would not wear out, Deuteronomy 8 verse 4, 29, 5 6. Most of the articles were perishable and those metal objects were closely guarded because of their value. 
Most likely the Israelites left their pottery in Egypt because they knew it would break so they used the brass given to them by the Egyptians. They would have had no personal religious articles because that would be idolatry. Due to the above factors, it is understandable that one would not expect to find archaeological remains. In summary, Egypt exploited the natural resources of Sinai and controlled certain roads in the northern part of the peninsula, but it was not within the borders of the land of Egypt. St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Jebel Musa, the traditional location of Mount Sinai. It was founded as both a monastic center and a pilgrimage site. The Basilical Church of Justinian inside the Cohen Pound was built between 548 and 565. In addition to the functional buildings, a burning bush and well of Moses are located within the walls of the monastery. False assumption number two, Mount Sinai is in the land of Midian. The second false assumption is that Mount Sinai is located in the land of Midian, which is identified as part of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, Williams 1990-68-74. I would agree with the proponents of Jebel Outlaws that Midian is in the area of northwestern Saudi Arabia today. I think most scholars would attest to that, par 1989, 39-66, 1996-213-218. However, the biblical text does not place Mount Sinai in the land of Midian. In an interview with Herschel Shanks, Professor Frank Moore Cross, retired professor of Hebrew at Harvard University, opines that the mountain of God was located in the land of Midian. When asked if he had a guess what mountain might be Mount Sinai, he responded, I really don't. There are several enormous mountains in what is now northwestern Saudi Arabia. Jebel el Laz is the highest of the mountain in Midian 8,465 feet higher than any mountain in the Sinai Peninsula, but biblical Mount Sinai need not be the highest mountain. There is some reason to search for it in southern Edom, which was Midianite terrain before the expansion of the Edomite south, Shanks 1992-32. He later put the Midian hypothesis in print, but did not endorse any mountains for the location of Mount Sinai, Cross 1998, 60-68. Yet the question is still remains, is Mount Sinai in Midian? The assumption that Mount Sinai is in Midian is based on Exodus 3 verse 1. As Cross, 1998, 61, says, this text presumes that the mountain is in Midian territory. It would be assumed that because Moses kept Jethro's flock of sheep and Jethro was a Midianite. When it says he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God, the mountain of God must be in Midian. Williams, 1990, 58, also states that Moses tended Jethro's flock at Mount Sinai for 40 years. First of all, it should be pointed out that the Bible, in this verse, does not state that Moses tended the flock at Mount Sinai for 40 years, nor does it explicitly state in Tehorab is in Midian. Second, I think a more plausible explanation of the geography can be given. For a moment, permit me to assume that Mount Sinai is outside the land of Midian. Below I will demonstrate this from scripture. It is important to note the chronology and context of Exodus 3 verse 1. In Exodus 2 verse 23 the king of Egypt, who wanted to kill Moses 40 years earlier, died, Exodus 2 verse 15, for verse 19 if. Acts 7 verses 23 and 30. Moses, while tending the flock in Midian for most of the 40 years, heard of his death. A plausible scenario of how he heard about the death was from some frankincense caravan that was returning from Egypt to South Arabia, MacDonald 1995, 1357. The children of Israel were groaning because of their bondage in Egypt and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Exodus 2 verses 23-25. Moses, who had a concern for his family, Exodus 4 verse 18, and a heart for the children of Israel, wanted to learn more about what was going on. He took Jethro's flock to Mount Sinai, we will assume Mount Sinai is located at Jebel Sin Bishar in western central Sinai. This region had good pasture land and was well watered, Harel 1983, 425. It is not unusual for Bedouin shepherds to go long distances to find pasture for their flocks. I have met Bedouin shepherds who come from the Beersheba region with their flocks north of Jerusalem, a distance of over 70 miles. What better cover could Moses want than being an old shepherd tending his sheep? Moses left Egypt as a 40-year-old Egyptian administrator, most likely clean-shaven and bald. 
now he was returning as an 80-year-old man, probably with a beard and white hair. At least that's what Charlton Heston looked like in The Ten Commandments. Nobody would recognize him after 40 years of being away, Contra Williams 1990, 59. The angel of the Lord, however, knew who he was and appeared to him in a burning bush, Exodus 3 verse 2 4 17. Moses returned to Jethro, in Midian, and asked his permission to return to Egypt after being away for 40 years, Exodus 4 verse 18. Jethro granted him permission and Moses set out toward Egypt. The Lord instructed Aaron to meet his brother at the mountain of God. Exodus 4 verse 27. The impression from the text is that Moses was almost back to Egypt when he met Aaron and not Aaron traveling all the way to Midian to meet Moses. If one looks at the Bible carefully, it will be observed that Mount Sinai is outside the land of Midian. Two verses demonstrate this placement. The first is found in Exodus 18. In the context, Moses and the children of Israel are camped at the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, brings his family to visit with Moses. During the course of their stay, Jethro gives Moses some invaluable advice about governing the people. In verse 27, it states, Then Moses let his father-in-law depart from Mount Sinai, and he went his way to his own land, Midian, and Kajavi, parenthetical statements added by the author. Jethro departs from Mount Sinai to return to his own land of Midian. The second verse that places Mount Sinai outside the land of Midian is found in Numbers 10. In the context, the children of Israel are getting ready to depart from Mount Sinai and Moses invites his brother-in-law, Hobab, to join them in going to the promised land, 1029. Hobab responds, I will not go, but I will depart from Mount Sinai to my own land, Midian, and to my kinsmen, 1030. Williams, 1990, 73, misses the point of this passage. He says Hobab is telling Moses that he has no desire to leave his homeland of Midian. Williams is assuming that Mount Sinai is in Midian. If that were the case, Hobab would have said, I will not depart, but stay in my own land and with my kinsmen. However, the text is saying Hobab wants to return to his own land, the place of his birth, Midian, which can only be done by departing from Mount Sinai, because it is outside his homeland. My thanks to Professor Feynman for pointing these two verses out to me. Harrell also makes this point, 1983, 250. False assumption number 3, Galatians 4 verse 25 says Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. The third false assumption is that the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4 verse 25 that Mount Sinai was in Saudi Arabia. Cornuck plainly states this when he says, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, informs us that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. Not Egypt. Cornuck and Holbrook 2000, 171. The Bible says nothing of the sort. Granted, the Holy Spirit could have predicted the kingdom of Saudi Arabia long before it came on the world scene. After all, he predicted Cyrus by name 210 years before he became king of Persia, Isaiah 44 verse 28, 45 verse 1 Antiquities of the Jews 11, 5, LCL 6, 315. Yet all the Bible says is that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Moses never uses the word Arab or Arabia at the time he wrote the Pentateuch. The words appear later in the Bible, 1 Kings 10 verse 15, 2 Chronicles 9 verse 14, 17 verse 11, 21 verse 16, 22 verse 1, 26 verse 7, Nehemiah 2 verse 19, 4 verse 7, 6 verse 1, Isaiah 13 verse 20, 21 verse 13, Jeremiah 3 verse 2, 25 verse 24, Ezekiel 27 verse 21. So the Apostle Paul does not have a mosaic use of the word Arabia in mind when he uses the word in Galatians 4 verse 25 because Arabia did not exist in Moses' day. The Galatians 4 verse 25 reference might indeed support the view that Mount Sinai was in Saudi Arabia if the Apostle Paul was looking at a 1990 Rand McNally atlas. However, it would not be true if he was looking at a 1st century AD Roman road map. Although no actual maps of Roman Arabia exist from this period, we do possess the accounts of the contemporary travelers such as Strabo, a Greek from Pontus, 64 BC to CA AD 25. He describes the borders of Arabia as having its eastern border at the Persian Gulf and its western border at the east side of the Nile River. 
This means that Strabo understood the entire Arabian Peninsula and the Sinai Peninsula to be included in 1st century Arabia, geography 16 colon 4 colon 2, 17 colon 1 colon 21, 24 dash 26, 30 31, LCL 7, 309, 8, 71 to 79, 85 to 87. The word Arab first appears in an extra-biblical inscription from a monolith found at Kirk from the time of Shalmaneser III, 853 BC. Throughout the Assyrian period, various Assyrian kings described the activities of the Arabs, or desert nomads. The first time the word Arabia is used as a term for a designated geographical area is in the mid-5th century BC by the famous Greek historian and traveler, Herodotus, born ca. 484 BC. He traveled to Egypt and wrote about his trip in his book, The Persian Wars. In his monumental work on ancient Arabs, Dr. Israel F. L. of Tel Aviv University points out that Herodotus calls the entire region east of the Nile and the Pollution Branch, from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea, Arabia, and its population Arabs, 2, 8, 15, 19, 30, 75, 124, 158. F. L. 1982, 193. Now in Arabia, not far from Egypt, there is a gulf of the sea entering in from the sea called Red, the Gulf of Suez, of which the length and narrowness is such as I shall show. Herodotus, The Persian Wars 211, LCLI, 285,287. Show less. Moreover, in the mid-3rd century BC, 72 Jewish scholars translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, known as the Septuagint, and followed the contemporary use of the word Arabia when they referred to Goshen as Goshen of Arabia, Genesis 45 verse 10, 46 colon 34. While Goshen is clearly part of Egypt, Genesis 37 verses 6 and 27, Exodus 9 verse 26, the translator imposed the 3rd century BC geographical reality on their translation. On Egeria's pilgrimage to the Holy Land, she visited Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa, and also the land of Goshen, Wilkinson 1981-91-103. In Goshen, she stayed at Klisma, a city of Arabia, Wilkinson 1981-100. She wrote, it gets its name from the region, which is called the land of Arabia, the land of Goshen, a region which, while it is part of Egypt, is a great deal better than any of the rest, 1981-100-101. Egeria followed the Septuagint reading of Genesis 46 verse 34 in her description of Goshen being in the land of Arabia. Therefore, when the Apostle Paul says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, he is using the 1st century AD understanding of the word. He would be perfectly correct in placing Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula because the Sinai Peninsula was part of Arabia in his day. In conjunction with Galatians 4 verse 25, Three other verses have been used to demonstrate that Mount Sinai was outside the Sinai Peninsula, Deuteronomy 33 verse 2, Judges 5 verse 4, and Habakkuk 3 verse 3. It is stated that Seir, Emtiparan and Taman are located in present-day Jordan or even Saudi Arabia, Heiser 1998, Cross 1998. Most scholars put the territory of Edom in the Transjordanian Mountains to the east of the Yarava and northeast of the Gulf of Aqaba. A careful examination of the scriptures places it also on the west side of the Arava, Numbers 34 verse 3, Josh 15 colon 1. The area, called today the central Negev Highlands, from the wilderness of Zin and Kadesh Barnea, south to Eilat was also Edomite territory, Crew 1981, 121 to 151, Rasmussen 1989, 91, Meshel 2000, 104. If this were the case, the locations of Seir, Paran, and Taman could be moved back into the central Negev Highlands and northeast Sinai. A case can be made for Paran being in the area of Kadesh Barnea, known today as Ein Kudirat, Numbers 13 verse 26. Emtisir could be identified with the Jebel Yasayire, 45 kilometers to the west of Eilat and west of the Kadesh Barnea Eilat Road, Harel 1983, 338. Taman would be located in the area of Kuntalit Adrud where the inscriptions with the name Yahweh of Taman were found, Meshul 1993. If these identifications are accepted, then these passages. Deuteronomy 33 verse 2, Judges 5 verse 4, Habakkuk 3 verse 3, refer to the Lord leading the children of Israel by the pillar of fire through the northeastern part of the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years. 11 days to Kadesh Barnea. Another major problem for the Jebel El-Law site is the statement by Moses that Ntihorab, 
Another name for Mount Sinai is 11 days journey from Kadesh Barnea, Deuteronomy 1 verse 2. It would be impossible to march more than 2 million Israelites through the difficult terrain from Jebel el laz to Kadesh Barnea in the allotted time. However, Wyatt, Williams, Blum and Kornick all ignore this problem. Biblical Kadesh Barnea has been located at Ein Kadesh, the spring of Kadesh, where the Arabic name preserves the biblical name Kadesh, in northeast Sinai. Others have placed it 10 kilometers to the northwest at the tell near Ein Kudirat that has an Iron Age fortress on it. Ein Kudirat is the richest spring in all of Sinai producing a flow of water at about 40 cubic meters per hour. Dothan 1965, 134 in a popular article on his excavations at Kadesh Barnea, Rudolf Cohen, 1981, 21, asks, has the site been correctly identified? If so, why have we found no remains from the Exodus period? I believe the area is correctly identified and as suggested before, would not expect to find remains of the Israelites. Others that place Mount Sinai in Midian recognize the 11 days problem and place Kadesh Barnea near Petra. The problem with this identification is that the southern border of Israel goes from the Salt Sea, Dead Sea, to the Sea, Mediterranean Sea, via the wilderness of Zin and Kadesh Barnea, Numbers 34 verses 1 to 5, Josh 15, 1 to 4. If Kadesh Barnea were in the area of Petra, then most of ancient Edom's territory would be in biblical Israel. Geographically, that does not make any sense. Misunderstanding the Archaeological Evidence those who hold to the Jebel al laws site as Mount Sinai are quick to point out the archaeological evidence. Their reasoning is, look what was found, everything fits, it must be the site. Let's look at the evidence and see if it really fits. Survey of the area Our treasure hunters write as if they were the first Westerners to explore Jebel al laws and the surrounding area to do research, Cornick and Halbrook 2002, Williams 1990, 101. Such is not the case. In the early 1950s, Harry St. John Philby visited the region of Midian and surveyed sites in the area. His book, The Land of Midian was published in 1957 and gives a detailed and reliable account of the topography of the country. Philby's descriptions of such ancient sites as he knew of and visited, such as Mogair Shuab, Rawafa, and Korea, are also, so far as they go, accurate and useful, but unfortunately his photographs are poor, and he did not publish any plans or any of the surface sherds and other antiquities which he diligently collected during his journeying, par, et. Al 1968-1969, 194. Philby, 1957, 209,215, viewed Jebel Outlaws from a distance and observed a patch of snow at the summit, but did not visit the mountain. Parr continues, prior to Philby's explorations, the region had received a certain amount of attention from travelers and orientalists during the 19th and very early 20th centuries. The early history of this activity has been recounted by Hogarth in The Penetration of Arabia, 1904, and includes such names as Burkhart, 1812, Rupel, 1826, Moresby and Wellstead, 1831, Wallen, 1848, Burton, 1877, Doughty, 1877-8, Huber, 1878 and 1883, and Uding, 1883. The construction of the Hejaz Railway between 1904 and 1908 made the area more accessible, and the opportunity to investigate was taken by such scholars as Jossen and Savignac, 1907-10, Moritz, 1910, and Musel, 1910, Pariti. Al 1968-1969, 196. Williams laments that he tried to get information on Jebel al laws and the caves at Albad from people in Saudi Arabia. He claims that the government had not produced anything on these archaeological remains, 1990, 183. As will be shown below, that is not the case either. Mount Sinai covered with smoke Williams and Cornick have pictures of the summit of Jebel al laws scorched black. Cornick attributes this to the smoke that covered the mountain when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 verses 16 to 20. He claims that the blackened rock had become a holy handprint for the ages. God placed his signature in heavenly flames in a fashion so electrifying, so stupefying, that man's proud logic and science would be hard-pressed to explain it, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 77. Williams, 1990, 78, is a bit more cautious concerning this evidence. Science may provide the answer. 
Cornick, Cornick and Halbrook 2075, and Williams 1990-167, brought back rocks for future laboratory analysis. They arranged for geologists to look at their rock samples, Cornick and Halbrook 2116. Researchers are interested in seeing the lab analyses, but they have been unavailable for the last 13 years. Judgment on this evidence should be withheld until the rocks have been scientifically analyzed and properly published. The altar of the golden calf The golden calf incident is recorded in Exodus 32, see also Deuteronomy 9 verse 21. When Moses did not return from his trip to Mount Sinai, the people requested Aaron make gods for them. He obliged them by taking their earrings and fashioning them into a molded calf. When he presented the calf he said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt, 32 4. How soon he and the children of Israel forgot the statement of the Lord that he brought them out of Egypt, Exodus 29 verses 45 and 46. The Bible says Aaron built an altar before the calf, Exodus 32 verse 5. Wyatt and Fossil found a huge pile of granite rocks in a plain about a quarter of a mile from the base of the mountain. On it, there were petroglyphs of bovine, bulls, cows and oxen, Fossil 1993b, 8. Wyatt and Fossil claims that a Saudi archaeologist from Riyadh University said these were Egyptian-style cows and bulls, and that they had never been found anywhere else in Saudi Arabia, Williams 1990, 210, 211. However, in a later article, Fuzzled, 1993b, 12, does not mention the archaeologist's claim, but attributes the identification of the bovine as Hathor and Apis to Wyatt, Fuzzled, 1993b, 8. At Fasold's trial, the archaeologist that represented the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia allegedly said, These drawings are the Hathor and Apis bull from Egypt I have never seen them in this country before, Williams 1990, 106. No Saudi archaeologist would say such nonsense. They would be well aware of the surveys that had been done in the area and the unpublished petroglyphs. They know that bovine petroglyphs were found in the Midian area as well as other parts of the country, Livingstone E.T. L1985, 132-134, plates 126, 127, 133, Naim 1990, 91, 92, 95. In all the archaeological literature that I read on rock art in Saudi Arabia, not once have I ever seen the word Egyptian connected with the bovine petroglyphs. Cornuck wondered why bovine petroglyphs were found in this area. He reasoned, this isn't cattle country. It is sheep country and had been for as long as men had walked these plains. Saudi Arabia has never been known for cattle unless, of course, they were driven here by the fleeing Israelites, Cornuck and Halbrook 2066. Williams makes similar statements as well, 1990, 106. What are we to make of this evidence? First, the Bible clearly states that Aaron, not the children of Israel, made the altar before the golden calf, Exodus 32 verse 5. I find it hard to believe that he could pick up these giant boulders and put them in place to make an altar. Cornick believed that this huge mound of stacked granite, Cornick and Halbrook 2064, was built by workers skilled in the art of building cities and moving mountains, Cornick and Halbrook 2065. This view is contrary to the scriptures. Aaron built the altar, not the Israelites. Second, one Saudi archaeologist who did his doctoral thesis on Saudi Arabian rock art dates the patched bovine to the Neolithic period, Khan 1991, 115, Plate 1. The Neolithic period is considerably earlier than the Late Bronze Age and the date of the Exodus from Egypt. Thus, it has nothing to do with the livestock the Israelites brought out of Egypt, Exodus 12 verse 38, 17 verse 3 and Numbers 20 verse 19, 32 verse 1, Deuteronomy 3 verse 19. Third, during the Neolithic period there was much more rainfall in Saudi Arabia than at the present, Ingram 1981, 62. Thus there would be ample grazing places for cattle then. One does not have to make the assumption the Israelites drove the livestock to Saudi Arabia. Fourth, let's assume for a minute that this was the site of the golden calf, however, I do not believe it is. Moses destroyed the golden calf because it was an idol. He would also have erased the petroglyphs of the bovine because they were graven images. Petroglyphs would be totally contrary to the law that Moses had just received from the Lord on Mount Sinai, Exodus 20 verse 4. 
To answer Cornuck's question, had we really stumbled upon the altar of the golden calf? Cornuck and Holbrook 2067. The simple answer is no. Cave of Moses Some two kilometers south of the town of Albad are caves called by the local people the Caves of Moses and Jethro. Philby, 1957, 214, records the local tradition at Bur el Sidney as the very, well, from which Moses rolled away the stone to draw water for the flocks of Jethro's daughters, if. Exodus 2 verses 15 to 19. Cornick, Cornick and Holbrook, 2089 to 104, Plate 13, and Williams, 1990, 177 to 183, Pictures 17 to 19, tell of their adventures in the Elbad area. It should surprise no one that there are traditions that Moses and Jethro lived in the area, after all, this is in the land of Midian, Exodus 2 verse 15, Acts 7 verse 29. The tradition stemmed from the fact that there were early Jewish traditions of them in the area, Kirkslugger 1998, 156-158, a Jewish community at the town of Magna to the southwest of Albad on the coast in the 9th century AD, if. Acts 2 verse 11. Musul 1926, 114, 115, and the Muslim tradition that Moses was one of their prophets, Bosworth 1984. However, the interpretations that Williams and Cornock put on these caves do not stand up to the facts. First, it is claimed that Moses and his family lived in these caves, Blum 1998 8, Play 2, Cornock and Halbrook 2000, 103. Second, Cornock relates that the local tradition states that Jethro and Zipporah were buried in these caves based on some inscriptions found in them, Cornock and Halbrook 2000, 99. Williams, 1990, 192, reluctantly came to the conclusion that these were burial caves. Unfortunately they give no serious consideration to the dating of these burial caves. The closest they come is to Williams, 1990, picture 19, claims that they have Egyptian fronts. What are the facts? The region around Elbad as well as these caves have been explored, surveyed, photographed and published long before Williams and Cornick ever visited the area, Musel 1926, 108 to 116, Philby 1957, 233, 257 to 262, Pariti. Al 1971, 30 to 35, Plate 12 to 17. The caves are called Magadar Shuab, the caves of Jethro, and are in reality, Nabataean tombs dating to the 1st century AD. They are not Midianite tombs dating to the Late Bronze Age. The so-called Egyptian front is similar to what tourists see on the Nabataean tombs of Petra when they visit that site. As for the inscriptions, Musul, 1926-112, found five tombs with them but no mention of Moses, Jethro, or Zipporah. Later, a British team of archaeologists resurveyed the tombs and found four inscriptions and published them, again saying nothing about Moses, Jethro, or Zipporah, par, et. Al 1971, 32, 59. The caves are much later than the time of Moses and have nothing to do with the Exodus narratives. The altar of Moses and the twelve pillars the Bible says that Moses got up early one morning and built an altar at the base of the Mount Sinai and set up twelve stone pillars representing the twelve tribes of Israel, Exodus 24 verse 4. At the base of Jebel al is an enigmatic stone structure. It is comprised pf three parallel V-shaped stone walls, Cornuck and Halbrook 2000, plate 11 top, 12 top. The verses are at a 45 degree angle and measures 120 feet in length. Cornick and Halbrook 2086. This complex has been identified as an angular stone altar, Ibid, trenches where they held the animals for sacrifice, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, play 12 top, or a temple, Williams 1990, 208, 211, Fazold 1993a, 10. Dr. Majid Khan, a Saudi archaeologist who worked on the survey of the area, has informed me that these are the remains of the living quarters for the miners of a marble quarry in the area. The pottery collected at the site dates to the Nabataean period 2nd century BC 1st century AD. White crude marble pillars were prepared there and exported to Petra for the buildings in that city. These pillars are not to be identified as the 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel as Williams, 1990, 212, claims. Williams, 1990, 97, states that the local Bedouins tell us the stones had been removed to hackle for a temple or monument erected by Solomon or Solomon. Fazold reported that some of the stones were removed in the 1930s to build a mosque in Hackle, 
1993 a 10. Elsewhere he says, there was mention that the temple was put there by Solomon, I think the name could have been Solomon, Williams 1990, 211. In a later publication, Fazold reported that their Bedouin guide, Ibrahim, claimed Suleiman erected the temple. He then goes on to say, it wasn't long before Ron, Wyatt, had the story elaborated into the temple being built by Solomon and Suleiman tearing it down to build the mosque, without a shred of evidence, Fazold 1993 a, 10. The only way the dating of this structure will be resolved is by an archaeological excavation. To add some confusion to the finds in the area, Wyatt and Fossil found large circular structures some 18 feet in diameter in the immediate area, Williams 1990, 208-210, Picture 3, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 124. Williams, 1990, Picture 3, says they are the twelve pillars representing the tribes of Israel, but Cornick discounts that and says they are either ceremonial platforms or large cisterns, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 124. From the photographs and drawings, they look to me like the cairns, large stone circles probably connected with burials that are typical to the northwest Saudi Arabian area. The date and function of the cairns are unknown, Ingram E.T. Al 1981, 69-71. Similar structures have been found elsewhere in the Levant. Mordecai Hyman, the excavator and surveyor of the cairn fields in the western Negev Highland in Israel, states that those cairns generally dated to the early Bronze Age were not burial sites, but were probably used in a death ritual, 1992, 25. I would also place the so-called boundary stones. Exodus 19 verse 12, in the same category, Williams 1990, 63, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, 85, 86, Plate 10 bottom, Blum 1998, Plate 6 bottom. Dr. Khan informs me that a book on the rock art and archaeology of the Albat area is in preparation by the Saudi Department of Archaeology. It will have a chapter on the archaeology of the Jebel al Laws area. We eagerly await this publication for a more definitive explanation of the archaeological remains. The split rock at Horeb Deuteronomy 9 verse 21 says there is a brook that descended from the mountain into which Moses threw the gold dust from the golden calf. Cornuck and Williams found a large ravine that snakes down the mountain. Cornuck observed, the ancient watershed a chalky, blister-dry remnant of a bygone wellspring was filled with large, water-polished boulders, clear evidence of a fast-rushing torrent. In a land that receives half an inch of rain per decade, it was proof that a stream of some magnitude had once caressed these rocks, Cornick and Halbrook 2082. They also show a picture of a rock that is split 20 inches apart and suggest this is the rock the Moses struck, Exodus 17 verses 2 to 6, Psalm 78 verses 15 and 16, 20, 105 colon 41, Cornick 2000, plates 8 and 9. Is this evidence of the split rock at Horeb? First, one should be cautious about making dogmatic statements based on photographs until a team of geologists is able to examine the rock closely. Second, Cornick implies that the smooth rock was a result of the river flowing from the split rock because the area only gets a half inch of rain per decade. While the area is classified as an arid desert, it does get 100 millimeters for inches or less rain per year that comes in the form of tropical monsoons, Ingramiti. Al 1981, 62. In Philby's, 1957, 205 to 228, account of his travels to the Midian Valley, he mentioned heavy rains and floods. Those people familiar with desert geology know that flash floods can provide the mechanism to polish the rocks, Cornick and Halbrook 2000, Plate 8, Bottom. Fasold's gold One of the reasons the treasure hunters went to the mountain was to look for the gold and silver that the children of Israel took from the Egyptians as they departed Egypt, Exodus 3 verse 22, 11 verse 2, 12 colon 35, 36. Fasold claims that his molecular frequency generator, MFG, produced readings that indicated the whole area was loaded with buried gold, the gold of the Exodus, Blum 1998, 59. He also claims that his MFG device picked up gold readings in the area of the Golden Calf Altar, Williams 1990, 107,108, Fossold 1993 b, 8. Is this possible? Gold in this area should not surprise any geologist or archaeologist. The land of Midian was noted for its gold mines. In 1982, before the treasure hunters showed up, a survey was done in the Jebel Outlaws area and two gold deposits were discovered. 
One at Jade Magda AR Riot, Site 2001004, northwest of Jebel El Laz and another in the Wadi Maswat, Site 2001003, on the southwest slopes of the mountain, Kisnawi, at all 1983-82, Plate 79. The surveyors indicate that one of the places gold is found is in alluvial deposits found in pits in the Wadi, dry river bed. The miner just sifts the gravel or sand to find the gold, 1983-77. Fazold had set up his MFG device about 50 feet from the edge of the wadi, Blum 1998A, 53. Samran's workers were digging in the wadi when they allegedly discovered the gold bracelet, 1998A, 58. One bracelet is insufficient evidence to claim that the gold of the exodus is located at Jebel al -Laz. Why is the area fenced in? The question has been raised, if the area is not an important historical site, then why is it fenced in? What are they trying to prevent people from seeing? In most countries, it is standard practice to fence in archaeological sites. There are at least four reasons why archaeologists fence in any given site. 1. To protect the sites from animals. In the case of Jebel al laws they might be concerned about sheep and goats knocking down the walls of the V-shaped altar. 2. To prevent military maneuvers from running over an archaeological site. 3. To protect the archaeological site from trespassers and vandals. 4. To prevent illegal excavations by treasure hunters. It seems reasonable to assume that the Saudi Department of Antiquities fenced in the sites after the first set of treasure hunters visited it because they were concerned others might follow. As it turned out, they were right. The Saudis are also members of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ICOMOS. This is an international non-governmental organization of professionals, dedicated to the conservation of the world's historic monuments and sites. To answer the questions raised above, the Saudis were protecting the sites and have nothing to hide. In fact, they should be commended for fencing in the sites to protect the world's historic sites and cultural heritage. The Conclusion of the Matter Contrary to their claims and the dust jacket endorsements that calls their evidence overwhelming and scholarly the case for Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia has not been made. The identification of Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia is not new. Other scholars and explorers have identified different mountains in Midian as Mount Sinai and such identifications have long ago received proper scholarly assessment. For example, Dr. Minashi Harel, one of Israel's leading geographers and an expert on the Sinai Peninsula, and for many years professor of historical and biblical geography at Tel Aviv University, researched these questions several decades ago in his doctoral dissertation at New York University. He reworked his dissertation and published it under the title The Sinai Journeys, The Root of the Exodus. In this book, Harel, 1983, 242-275, spends a whole chapter refuting the idea that Mount Sinai is in Midian, Saudi Arabia. Professor Harel also sets forth a very plausible alternative for the identification of Mount Sinai. He proposed Mount Sinai should be located at Jebel Sin Bishar in western central Sinai. This proposal is followed in the Zondervan NIV Atlas of the Bible, Rasmus in 1989, 88-90. In the next article, Professor David Feynman, 1986, 1989, 1994, of Ben Gurion University of the Negev will discuss Harel's proposal. Simply stated, Mount Sinai should be located in the Sinai Peninsula right where the Bible places it, not in Saudi Arabia. Footnotes